for this week on Reimagining Education. I was excited to ask Sherry Cohen and Cynthia DeWint to join us because they were in Learning Creative Learning the first time and then we learned at the beginning of Learning Creative Learning 2 that they had been taking the ideas and really running with them and taking them in directions that I had never imagined. So we wanted to share that as inspiration for others to take the ideas and run with them. And I also asked Rick Rose Roque to join us since she was part of the planning and running of Learning Creative Learning 1. And she thinks a lot about running workshops, so I thought she could have some good questions for us and perspective on this. So I thought we'd dive in, maybe taking us back to last year when, well, one of the things I remember was, Sherry, you posting in the forums that you weren't sure how to apply the ideas from Learning Creative Learning 1 and how they applied to your work in human rights work. So could you say a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I remember when I got the invitation or someone had passed it to me, like this LCL1 was happening, I, I got very excited about just you know reading the blurb about it. It sounded something really interesting. And I think the first, um, the first couple of sessions um, felt more about like learning creative learning and then it kind of went more into the digital realm which is not really where I work so I felt like you know oh like my enthusiasm started to like plummet and I thought is this about computers because if it's about computers I don't know what I'm gonna get out of this but the first cu couple of, of sessions were so inspiring that I just kind of stuck with it and it just so happened that I had invited another colleague Cynthia DeWint to join me um, we're both in the we work in the international relief and development sector, and so I invited a bunch of, of our colleagues, and she and I were really the only ones that had the time and the interest to do it full time for the course. And so we started, you know, batting about ideas, and suddenly we like slowly, bit by bit, started kind of taking little building blocks of LCL one and figuring out how they fit into the puzzle of of where we work. <laughs> Cynthia, what do you remember about starting to get involved in the process? Well, I got excited. I'm not very good with computers at all, so I, but I thought I have to venture. So I even tried my hand at Scratch, but <laughs> as I was trying, and I love the spaghetti challenge, and um, so uh, the learning by doing, I was very excited, and then listening to the stories of the different speakers, and then what I looked at is the word principles that apply to working with adults, which is what a lot of time I spend doing. Um, and so for me it was like, oh yes, um, uh, building the prototype. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> I didn't manage to build a prototype, but I could see where the, the workshops that we normally do could be seen as prototype. And I had made a pledge when all of us consultants in this field got together that I wanted a different way to design my workshops. Yeah, and so with, with Shari it was like, oh, I have a buddy and we can try these things out um, even though it was not in the digital field, but the principles apply to learning and I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah, do you want to say a little bit more, either one of you, about sort of before and after how you started you said starting why and how you started to tinker with the workshops that you do um, I, I, let me start just um, yeah. because I had a need that um, Cynthia helped okay. me <laughs> then she can I'll pass it to her but um, okay. in the past we've both been consultants for UN agencies and international NGOs and we often in the field we work in Africa Asia Latin America um, with developing um, you know, developing country projects, um, primarily in healthcare, you know, public health, education, uh, gender, um, things like that. And so I would go to countries and I would hold these workshops that were usually a five-day full week workshop. They were very intensive and they were meant to create social and behavior change communication strategies at a national level or province level. And we had all these worksheets and we had all these PowerPoints and we would just basically spend a week Here's, you know, here's the next session, here's a bunch of PowerPoints, here's the concepts, here's the worksheets that go with it. And so the filling out of the worksheets was the participatory part, but 
I was starting to realize like there was just something intrinsically missing. There was like it was like a puzzle, and some of the key pieces were not there, and I didn't realize that the puzzle the puzzle pieces were missing until I would go back to a country, like I I helped uh, create a national strategy for a type of um, HIV AIDS intervention in Uganda, and went back to the same country two years later. And my scope of work was like weirdly similar to two years prior to that. And so when I got back in the country, I went to the people who work in the HIV AIDS sector at the national level and I said, hey, what happened to that strategy that seems like I'm being asked to do the same thing again two years later, but don't you guys already have this from last time? And they said, oh yeah, well we're all new and we don't know what happened to that, but we need to start over again. And so I kept having these experiences where I would take people through a five-day workshop. They would get this product that they felt very um, proud of, but then it would just kind of peter out. The enthusiasm would wane um, and the ownership that I saw in the workshop was not sustained, sustained over the long term. So they would get pulled in different things and this great product that they created just kind of went by the wayside and they got sucked back into business as usual. So I knew that something was wrong with the process I, and I wasn't really sure quite what that what the wrong part was. Um, and then I met Cynthia um, through a group of consultants who are also doing social and behavior change and um, you know when we started taking the LCL1 I think we both started having like personal little aha moments firing mm -hmm. off like after every class. Mm -hmm. If we take this and we put it in here, and we kind of like mix it around in our, as Cynthia calls it, our cosmic kitchen, and we, you know, <laughs> create something different with the same ingredients. What what would it look like to to our work? And I'll pass it on to Cynthia to carry on. <laughs> well, I, I think that um, the cosmic kitchen, mixing things up, which which was even though I didn't manage to do anything with scratch, what got to me was they were building blocks, and. Mm -hmm. If I took my the outline of like a, a capacity building workshop and think of the elements as building blocks and then how could we make them as exciting that people would share, people get their aha, the different elements that we now see in, in this, um, you know, in terms of that it's a project, that you have other people, that you play with it and that, you know, you share it and then you try it again. So these elements, as, you know, let's apply them, which is what Shari and I have been doing, you know, and it brings to me the element of learning that is, it's playful learning. So not only the people in the workshop learn, Shari and I who are facilitating the workshop, we are also learning. Yeah, I think that's a really, Cynthia brings up a really good point about just the word learning and what that, you know, the connotations of that. What we used to do before was workshops and training and it was like basically data dumping a bunch of knowledge onto people and saying this is how you can improve your project you know your programming here's a bunch of new stuff okay go and but they weren't really learning it and so we've taken the principles of tinkering and and um, and play and and creativity and we've just completely retooled and reimagined what was possible and you know, the first time we did one of our learning labs, we were really like, you know, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? And people were just so energized. And, you know, then we did the next one, and it was even better. And we thought, you know, yeah, but is that just a one-off thing? Like, you know, lightning only strikes once, and we'll never get like a second time. And then we did the same thing in a completely different region, and it was, you know, even better. And so I think we feel pretty confident that incorporating all of these creative learning approaches and really creating and more focusing more on creating the environment for exploration and creating a culture of asking questions and not being afraid to trip and fall and stumble but that you can experiment and you can do it in a, in the safety of an environment where people aren't going to say you know you're wrong that's not that's the wrong answer um, has been really incredibly transformational for people but it's also very scary because We'll always get a few people in our in our learning labs who say yes, but the facilitator should tell us what the right answer is at the end yep. of the session. You know, yep. even after they've heard the right answer from their peers, you know, through an exploration of like activities, games, and dialogue. Um, so it's been kind of interesting, you know, watching some people get it right away, some people it takes them the week to get it, and other people um, are still kind of struggling 
with it, but everyone takes away something valuable. Would you say, Cynthia? Yeah, and, and I think in that is also when we are willing to relinquish control for the process as we planned it, but are flexible enough to coordinate this environment in which people feel free to tinker. And it's that letting go, it's allowing, it's um, uh, showing that, yes, as facilitators, we are not perfect. We're here. It's like what they said today about the Lego. It is the idea that you change it, <laughs> you improve it. So, and that the improvements can and should come from the users. So we want participants to start taking over sessions. And by day three, when they do that, I think we're on the way to success. <laughs> no? Like an example of how you took something that was a PowerPoint or a worksheet and turned it into a participatory activity. Okay, so there. Um, yeah, you can talk about the modes of participation. Yeah. So there was, um, you know, we work in the field of social change, and so um, we have some colleagues who have great minds, and they have some great PowerPoints that are chock full of like really heady intellectual, just deep, deep, you know, in interesting stuff. But when we thought about taking this into an, a learning arena where we have people who, you know, some people are secondary school graduates, some people have gone to, you know, university, some people have post-grad, some people have studied overseas or not, some people live in pretty remote places or not, we wanted to figure out, like, how can we take this information and share it with everyone in a way that they can get it because, you know, it's, it's sort of a human right that everyone should have access to to quality information and knowledge and it shouldn't just be people who have, have been schooled at a certain level you know can get this stuff so it was about how do we how do we um, simplify in a way that everyone could understand these key concepts that were quite quite intellectual so I would go through and find um, for example the, the modes of participation was basically me looking at a PowerPoint, which was this, you know, nifty animated PowerPoint. You would click a button and a new row would zoom onto the screen and it was all very nifty, but um, when we used it the first time around as a PowerPoint, it was just a lot of information for people to take in. And so I stared at that thing for hours and all of a sudden I realized, oh, I can deconstruct this and make it into a game. And so it was already in a grid format, like a big table. So I basically just deconstructed it and I transferred each of the blocks onto a separate Word document. So each each tile became like one page of a Word document. And then I printed them out, you know, in really big font. And then I took them to Kinko's and I had them printed on colored um, cardstock. Mm -hmm. And then um, each each row was a different color, uh, which coordinated with a different component of a mode of, of um, participation, which is a, a human rights-based approach at looking at whether we are engaged in tokenistic participation or full empowered people, you know, doing it by and for themselves participation. And much of development is still the tokenistic part, quite frankly. So it, it was a really important concept to get across. And um, we basically just, you know, created this table game where we would give each of the tables layer at a time and instead of building from the top down, we had them build from the bottom up because the bottom section was like the, the section that really was the part they could resonate with. It had descriptions of different types of, of ways of working with communities that they would resonate with more easily rather than looking at the top of it which had like headings that were like co-option which were a bit difficult to understand. So we had them built from the bottom up and and they you would go through a whole um, it was a, it was a dialogue process of just you know dis discussing and hashing out and moving these different squares around and it was a different type of learning and it's one of the sessions that in the anonymous online evaluations that we do after each event it's one of the sessions that gets the highest marks and people say you know that was really like a deep learning moment for me because I realized that I was um, like someone in Nepal recently just said. I realized that I thought I was actually being participatory, but I actually was really being tokenistic with my with my uh, counterparts in the community, and I had no idea I was being tokenistic. I thought I was being rights based, mm -hmm. and that kind of like aha moment just to have through a game wasn't coming through in a PowerPoint presentation. So you know we've just tried to wherever possible do things that hit people kind of. Um, in in their in their feeling sector in their emotions and we find that 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 creates a, a window opening for deeper learning 
I don't know, Cynthia, if you want to talk about some of the video discussion starters we use. Yes, um, actually, when you said about that, the way of deeper learning, we in involve their hearts, their emotions, because we find that the other way that we were doing workshops, we maybe spoke to their heads, maybe gave them activities to do with their hands, but by addressing the feeling emotional state about communication, about participation, about social norms, um, that that is what took the learning to a deeper level. And we are always surprised what comes out. For example, on the same thing with participation, we have communicato um, participatory communication and non-participatory communication. Again, beautiful slide sets and PowerPoints. And then one day, I looked. I was looking at it, and then I found video clips of Alvin Ailey. You know, um, it was an ad for their new season. And, and I found one that reminded me so much of participatory communication. And the uh, another one that reminded me of non-participatory communication. So we thought maybe, and they are only like two minutes, yeah? After dealing with a lot of the concepts and people have been talking, so then we said, okay, we're going to show a video and you tell us which of these two videos remind you of the concepts that we've been talking about in participatory and non-participatory communication. Well, the way people use the concept was so striking. Some of the comments they make, and then still people had doubts, like, um, but after discussing all of that, non-participatory communication is good, no? So then we ask, would you live in a country that has non-participatory communication? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it became very clear. Nobody wanted to live in that country. <laughs> so I think by addressing the feeling emotions and people putting themselves in the place and using films, using games, I think it draws people into the concept in a way that only talking about it wouldn't do. I'm curious, uh, it's been great to hear all the different ways that you've been um, kind of incorporating the, the principles you've learned from the course and into the, the work that you do. Um, I'm curious also, as your strategies of engagement have changed, what also um, your strategies of evaluating people's experiences. You mentioned there was a survey that you gave them at the end, but uh, during the workshop and after the workshop, um, how do you know how things are going for the participants? Are there certain signs that you look for, um, things that you ask yourself to understand how it went? Actually, what we ask is that they do it. So on the first day of the workshop when we're setting the um, we're asking people what are the norms for learning and what group agreements they can make to make it a learning full event for them. So they make these and then we select and or they, we make a sign up sheet so people can be eyes, ears or guardians of the process. And these people that select every day we have different sets of eyes, ears and guardians. They sit in in the evening planning session when we reflect on the day and look at the, the day ahead. So at that point, it's very raw in front of us, like this was good, this wasn't good, this we like, um, we want more of this, um, can we spend more time outside, um, can we have more time for discussions, can we change groups? So all kind of requests to make it more relevant for their way of learning according to the norms that they set and agreed upon in the beginning. Now, these processes, we call them uh, processes of participation, but it's also that they take ownership for their learning. Um, it's almost like a learning contract if you take, of, take it you know, in a larger course. But for the five days, um, they will go through it, and in one of the last workshops that we had, um, the third day was completely changed on the suggestions of participants. They ran the sessions, they decided how it would go mm -hmm. on the basis of their needs. 
I don't know. Does that does that make yeah, sense? Can you explain what you mean by eyes, ears, and guardians? Oh, I'm sorry. You want to tell about the eyes and ears and how we visualize them? Yeah, yeah. We have some uh, photos we can share with you in, in detail um, to show everyone here. But basically, the eyes and the ears are looking and listening, but actively, proactively, not passively. Their job throughout the day is to, you know, like be observing, looking and, and listening and hearing what, what's the tittering going on underneath, like the undercurrent, what are people saying about like that we that we can't hear because you know we're in a different part of, of you know we're in a different mindset leading everything. What are people saying about you know during the tea breaks, during lunch? Um, is there some kind of dynamic that's not working? You know, are people like really energized? Are they lagging? Do they need energizers? Like what what's going on? Um, so eyes and ears are responsible for that and um, you know, we give them funny props to use just to kind of make it something that they really enjoy doing. <laughs> and then the guardians get like a sheriff's badge, and they're basically like in charge of of managing the group um, because oftentimes it, it falls on us as facilitators. And again, you know, we're we're coming into multicultural situations where there's different types of social norms about this type of stuff, and we don't want to be people's parents. We're all adults, and we're all there for hopefully the same reason. So we put it to them to say, look you don't like people are still texting on their phones or there's like you know side talk you deal with it you figure out a way to deal with it so for example in the the most recent learning lab we had in Nepal I think on the third on the third day or so they were they were really annoyed with a certain group of people kept coming late after breakfast and they would walk in after we had already started the first session and then everyone felt compelled to go back and like start over again so they said, okay, we still have some latecomers, and they decided that they would make them do a Nepalese monkey dance, which was just, you know, this this funny kind of like dance that they had to do. So any anybody who was late coming to the room had to stand at the side of the room, and when all the latecomers had assembled, they made each one do like their own separate monkey dance in front of everyone before they could sit down and then join the group. And I mean, if we tried to do that, that would have been like, you know, Culturally, people would have said, you know, oh, I can't believe you're doing that to people. That's terrible, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't us doing it. It was participants saying, like, this is appropriate, like, kind of, like, just razzing our, our, our peers a little bit for being late. And so we let them figure out how to take care of all this stuff. Um, you know, one day they were really, we were at a forest resort, um, the last place we were at, and people wanted to take, like, a walk in the forest, but there was never enough time. So they wanted to do that on the last day, and we said, "Look, we're here for we're here for a specific purpose. But you know, if if you want to do this, this is the time we can do it." And they had to get up super early and make a commitment to do that and be back in the room by a certain time, and that we would stay a little bit later that day, even though they wanted to leave earlier. So that was their decision. They voted. They decided what to do, um, and it works out really well. You know, we've had we had a situation where somebody made a comment that was a bit callous towards one of the other participants' comments, and so that came out during the Guardian discussion at the evening planning meeting, and so we had to figure out a way around that, and again, instead of us dealing with it, we said, you know, should we talk to the person? They said, no, 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 we'll take care of it, we'll figure out what to do, and so they addressed the next day, because the eyes, ears, and guardians for like day one, they report back in the first morning of day two about what was, mm -hmm. what they observed mm -hmm. from the previous day. Um, any kind of um, important points that come out in the planning meeting with us, they report back. And then they also award a prize to the person who best models the um, the group norms and agreements for the previous day. So, you know, there's like a little kind of incentive for people, and people get really caught up in like who's going to win the prize. <laughs> and as Cynthia said, this whole thing, it creates this shift of ownership, which is a really, really it's transformational and it's 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 empowering to us to see people empowered you know so for example i think it was about wednesday or so when people were so comfortable each, with each other we noticed that when the eyes and ears um, like in the morning of day 3 were handing over their badges and their props to that day's team after reporting they started doing this very formal like they would bring them up and they would shake each other's hand and mm -hmm. give them like the, the big glasses or the big ears or the sheriff's badge and pin it on them and it was like okay I'm passing the baton to you now today is your turn to watch out for everybody and that was that was the first time we had them be very deliberate about that but again that was all them really like saying you know this is this is becoming by and for us. Um, can I, I also wanted to just touch on something that Rick Rose asked. I think you were talking sort of about evaluation at the mm -hmm. top of the question, yeah? 
Yeah, well, I, I think it's um, I think it's really interesting you brought this up too because I, I think uh, for learners to also uh, get a sense for how they're doing, how their peers are doing, and how the environment is going. So I, I found this kind of eyes, ears, and guardians a really interesting structure to that reflects that. Um, but it also from your perspective as a facilitator and someone who's designing the environment, um, how are you? How do you also think about kind of I'm just curious, like, what your reflective process is, too, um, in seeing um, how, I guess, the question of, like, how are things going and what might you need to change or maybe kind of nudge for the next day? I think well, in, the, in the evening meetings, we do ask questions as well. I mean, the whole thing is, when Shari said about establishing a culture of asking questions, we ask questions about how we are doing as well. If things came, if the concepts were clear, if the games made it clearer for people to participate and and understand what it was about. So um, yes, we do ask questions. We do pick up from people's response to the activities that um, if we are on the right track or not, and. Um, uh, when when people feel comfortable to change the course of a day that was planned, I think that to us shows that they have taken on the learning from their point of view because they, it has to make sense to them. They wanted to spend more time on um, like a set of principles about how do you plan communication. And what they wanted to do was show us what they were doing and using those concepts. And the realization was that so much of what they were doing had already elements of the new concept that we brought in. And so mm -hmm. that realization to us is a big confirmation that the new building blocks that we brought in already fitted some of the processes they were using. Yeah. So when we see something like that, even though we didn't set out that day to have that session, they used that session and it showed to us that they were already using those elements. Do you want to, you guys um, also talk to me about like the most significant change and the interviews that you did at yeah. the end. Yeah. The other, one of the other mechanisms we have is um, we do, um, we offer like a, a written and video blogging. Um, it, since we were doing this under uh, the umbrella of a particular organization, we used their internal blog system. But um, I would love to be able to do it in a more, you know, sort of open blog session or uh, on a website created specifically to share this kind of information because the video blogging is very powerful. And the written blogging, it's some of the most eloquent, beautiful, um, transformational things I've ever read. And, you know, it's it sounds almost sort of like self-defeating for me to say like I can't believe this comes from colleagues you know that that one of my colleagues wrote something that was so striking and I mean this is the person who it takes them four days to get from the the place where they live to Kathmandu in the capital of Nepal it takes me less than two days to get to Nepal from San Diego so that just shows you how remote they are and yet the the, the sort of poetic, you know, sort of description of this person's journey was so transformational and so like incredibly moving that those are the things that I think for Cynthia and I are like they help us to to reflect personally on like whether we're on the right or wrong track. We also in implemented in the second learning lab that we did a journal, you know, slash diary component and we wanted to do that because we're all about participatory research monitoring and evaluation. Part of what my personal interest is in, is in destigmatizing, simplifying, and deconstructing research monitoring and evaluation because so many of our colleagues think that that is a realm that you have to have a PhD from a fancy university and you have to be super smart with numbers. And we're trying to say to people, no, it's common sense. It's taking the time to listen to other human beings and connect on, on that humanity level and you can actually find creative mechanisms for research monitoring and evaluation, one of which is the most significant change story approach. So we give people, and again, we just touch on this over the course of the week because this could be a full five-day learning lab in and of itself, but we give people at the end of day one small journals, and we have a little bit of a, uh, like a very, um, just a, 
a little uh, pasted in of the inside of their journal question guide just to guide them. They don't need to answer or ask themselves those questions every day, but it's just to get them thinking because many people have not ever journaled or kept a diary before. And we ask them every night before you go to sleep or at some point, you know, after the day is finished, just take a few minutes to yourself, reflect on the day, and then write down your thoughts about, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, not just what you learned, but how you felt about the day. It could also be personal stuff about, you know, your your time at this learning event. It doesn't have to all be related back to the topics at hand. And then at the on the evening of day four, these are five day events, on the evening of day four we ask them for homework to write their own most significant change story. And by that time we've already introduced the concept of using people's stories in their own words to figure out you know, whether you're actually making headway or you're achieving success in a project. And in fact, one of the one of our Nepal participants said that that was the most striking and most meaningful uh, session to them because it never occurred to them as a project officer sitting in the capital city to ask one of their stakeholders at the community level to tell their story in their own words. This person said, "I always tell their story in my own words about what I think their story is, but it never occurred to me to ask them, tell me your story." And then I will carry that story back, you know, and, and, and let you speak for yourself. And, you know, it might seem like a no-brainer, but we get so entrenched in how, you know, the social norms of how we do things and, and whether it's programming or formal education that these just sort of, uh, these little light bulb aha moments that go off all kind of connect together to create um, an experience of, as, as many people in Nepal said, like they had moments of self-realization where they, they really understood, there's, this is how I'm doing things now. This is not how I want to do things in the future. I see a new way forward, and I have the knowledge, the skills, and some tools to do that. And so for us, that's like, that's just the best, you know, that's the best sort of way to reflect on things is to really hear from people themselves their own stories of change. And then you had them at their tables tell each other stories, right? And then yeah. you... On the last day, the very last official exercise is we have table groups, like, you know, four, usually four to five tables. And so each table, people have to pull out their stories and they read them to each other. So there's maybe about eight people at a table. So they go around and they read their stories to each other. And it can be really emotional because they don't... We had one table in, in, <laughs> in, our, in our Zanzibar workshop where they said everybody... It was the crying table. Everybody was like <laughs> weeping after every story was told. And I said, are they bad? Are they like really upset? And they said, no, no. <laughs> They're just like so moved by everyone's stories that once they started crying after one story, everyone told their story and it was like everybody was just like, you know, teary-eyed. But then that table, each table has to vote for the story that best represents their collective experience over the course of the week. So we're not trying to sort of set up a competition at the table level of like, I write better than you, so my story won. It's which story works best. And then from there, those five stories are read aloud to the whole room and then the whole room, by, by virtue of applause, determines what the finalists, the two final stories are, and then by applause, which is the, which is the, the finest story that shows the most transformation. And in fact, um, it was interesting to Cynthia and I that in our Zanzibar workshop in Africa, um, I think all but one of the tables decided that they wanted to compile their stories, and so they, on the spot, quickly rewrote their stories to have elements of all of the stories <laughs> woven into it, which I thought was really interesting. They said, can we, can we, you know, rewrite our story and, like, have threads of everyone's story in it? And we kind of were, like, sitting there going, I guess so. There's no rules here. So. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was really interesting. And so there, those are all of the ways that we kind of... Um, that we, we reflect, I think, through the eyes of our participants, really, if I'm answering your original question, Rick Rose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have our own discussions on the side about how we think things are going, but it always ties back to looking through the process through our learners and, and what, they're, what they're experiencing and expressing to us. So we give them as many creative options to express as we can. Um, we also have, like, daily evaluations that are participatory. It can be something as simple as, having like a mood board with, you know, four or five different, like, you know, smiley faces in different, you know, uh, moods, and they just walk behind it and stick a sticker on whichever, you know, whichever mood they feel for the day. It can be um, writing with uh, cards out, like, you know, just posting a card on, like, what was the most uh, profound and the least, you know, impactful 
session of the day. We have a variety of, of things that we do on a daily basis. So we've got a lot of different things going on simultaneously that are both teaching people different varieties of how to themselves use participatory you know, monitoring and evaluation techniques, but are also monitoring and evalu evaluation techniques for us during the course of the week. I guess some of the other um, images that I wanted to ask you about. So one of them is like the agenda for the five days that you have that it's this very visual beach scene with different umbrellas mm -hmm. and things. Could you say a little bit about how that came about? And I'll let Cynthia touch on that. That's her thing. <laughs> um, I liken the, the learning events to going on a journey. And so like in Zanzibar we thought the journey is that we saw around us was people walking on the beach going from one place to the next. And also in Zanzibar it, it's known for special Zanzibar doors. So for me was it's walking on the beach and going to a door that opened new possibilities. So um, each day was a beach umbrella and we collected sand from the beach and put it in the in the footsteps to bring the flavor of the place and that people could relate to because they are in a new place and if we could say that every day took us from one place to the next so we would call give every day a theme and it was like to entice people to move a, to start moving from where they started and end up in a new place. And um, the one for Nepal, I think what inspired me was that they have these beautiful um, lamps, oil lamps, and so every day was a different oil lamp because again, there we played with the idea of light, and when they start a journey, someone lights a lamp. Um, and and so that, that we also played with that idea um, of um, every day a theme that will take them and show light on a new topic. And I, I, we try to have the day and the place inspire us and hopefully that also comes across um, inviting the learners to participate, to go on a journey. And if I could just add to that, um, we had a couple of people, I think it was I don't think it was in Zanzibar, I think it was in Nepal, a couple of people came up to us and said, where can we buy these road maps? And then we started laughing and said, no, 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 you can't buy them. I said, Cynthia drew this. And they looked at us and said, you made this? But how did you know, you know, and they were pointing to like, we, we had, it was a Bodhi tree, and, and the, um, which is the tree of enlightenment, and then the, the Dia lamps were hanging from it, and the, the Himalayan range was in the background, and there was a door, a Nepali carved door, which opened... Um, on the way to like Budanoff Stupa, which has the eyes of the world drawn on it. So our, our final destination, it was all about, you know, like self-realization and, you know, we were in the land of Buddha, like, you know, of course that's going to inspire us. And it was just funny because when people realized that, oh, you made this? And we said, well, yeah, we just looked around and we, you know, we're familiar with Nepal. We know, we know what the iconography is and we saw all these lamps around us and so on and so forth. And, it's a journey and you know et cetera et cetera and they were kind of like you could see the wheels moving like oh I can do this too for and I, we said yeah, you can customize any way you want and then ironically right after about a month after the Nepal event we had our first second generation event which was one of our alumni graduates from Zanzibar is from Nigeria and she had her own learning lab for a wider variety of partners because they could only bring like I think three partners with them to Zanzibar so she had about 20 partners come to the capital and she did her version of an SBCC learning lab um, social and behavior change communication learning lab and she asked me again uh, where can I buy one of the roadmaps and I said no remember Cynthia drew that and she said oh right and I said why don't you try making one for yourself, you know, and I just said get some big brown paper and, you know, it doesn't have to be like perfectly drawn and sure enough they did their own and they used their own iconography and um, I have like a not so great picture of it, it's hard to see it, but I mean it was really, it was really heartwarming for me to see someone, you know, taking just simple things and moving them forward. Another thing that we noticed was that the way we do our agendas, you know, we, we have like the daily themes as Cynthia was pointing out and we had made a logo for for one of the organization or one of the uh, one of the first events, and then I started to see subsequent um, 
anything that was related to this topic from that group of people, they started using the logo and they started kind of nicening up, if you will, their materials. And it was just a small thing, but it, it, showed, it showed a different level of pride in their work and that being creative in little ways just made them feel good about their work. And so there's just stuff happening on so many different levels um, as a result of, of these learning labs. And, you know, the learning labs that we do are a result of LCL1 and what we got out of that. So it kind of all comes <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me to see. I guess another way where you said, like, really let them be creative was something, did you say at the beginning, they tell the story of their project to each other and they can use different medium, they can tell a story, or is that what it was yeah. at the beginning? Yes, yeah. they, create, they create a poster. On day one in the morning we have what's called a project share fair. And it's so that everybody um, can understand what everyone else's projects, because if you're, in, if you're in a country, you might be working in different districts and one district might be focusing on one particular project that focuses on, you know, village level health workers, while another one might be focusing on uh, young people working in factories. So the projects can be very different, and they often don't have that cross collaboration, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, you know, co-learning um, opportunities. And so we try to create that by having people create their own posters. And the first time we did it, we were just really stunned at the level of creativity. I mean, we had <laughs> our partners in Ghana were like, we brought things like crepe paper, and one of my colleagues said, um, "This is the most." tricked out art supplied workshop I've ever been to. And it's not a workshop, it's a learning event. And um, you know, we bring all kinds of stuff, you know, glitter pens and crepe paper and stickers and you name it, it's there. And I mean this woman was like sitting at this table while everyone was making her poster and she was making these rosettes um, made a, made out of the colors of the country's flag. And she and at the end when I saw it all put together I was like, oh my God, that's the most beautiful thing. But it's, you know, it was just stunning to me, the level of creativity. And we started to, Cynthia and I started to think that better to have people make, like, they make the share fair posters, you know, and we ask them, you know, it's a visual representation of your, of, of what you're doing. So we ask them to, like, tell us what is the project? Like, what's it supposed to be? What are you most proud of about the project? And then what are the key successes? Because sometimes what you're most proud of is different from the successes. And then we ask them, what are your barriers, your challenges, you know, I mean, your failures? And we talk about having, like, a specific failure fair um, at some mm -hmm. point. We haven't done a full failure fair. But what we do is we encourage them in a nurturing and in a safe way so that it's okay for them to say, this particular thing is not working so well. And one of the guiding questions we ask is, ask us a question. Ask us as a group of co-learners, of co, think of us all as co-consultants to each other for the week. What would you like help on? Is there a question or an issue you want us to help you answer? Um, and we'll try to work together on that on the side during the week. So they present this on day one, and then we, we sort of bookend it with day five in the morning. They create their next steps roadmap, is, which is to basically map out what they're already doing in key milestone markers, and then take what they learned about social change and behavioral change and add into it things that are, we ask them to like denote what things can you add in, like what principles and processes that are, that are low cost, I mean no cost, that you can do right now forever. What things are low cost that maybe if you move some budget things around or you incorporate something into an existing you know, event, you can get that done. And then what things do you want to work on that you need additional funding for? And so we ask them to really think about the no cost and the low cost is what can you do now now? Like, what do you not need anybody to, like, give you a, a check to do? Like, you can just do forever. And so it becomes about what have you really learned and what's important to you, which also sort of goes back to what Rick Rose asked earlier about evaluating and monitoring and reflecting in terms of we don't expect everybody to come out of this with the same exact carbon copy, you know, learning um, experience. And everybody gets something different and everybody focuses on a specific thing that resonates most deeply to them or a few things that resonate most deeply to them. And it's totally okay with us if it's a different thing for you versus the, another person. I mean, one person might just think, you know, most significant change stories are awesome and, like, I see the power in stories and I need to, like, incorporate that now. Someone else might say, you know, wow, rights-based approaches is something that I had no idea about and it's changed my life, and I'm going to, like, look at everything I do from a rights-based lens from now on. So it sort of brings up the challenge of, like, when you are truly creating creative learning environments, and it's okay with you um, 
as the person or people who are creating an environment that's you know uh, ripe for creative learning, um, even if you're okay with like people coming away with different learning, how do you make people who are not okay with that, you know, who are who who say, well, at the end of this course, you have to be able to do X, Y, and Z, you know? So we we think about our objectives, um, our learning objectives, and we craft them in such a way so that you can kind of go in any direction underneath that. But we have to be very conscious when we do when we create objectives that um, they're not too too sort of like one note, one dimensional, or too structured. And that's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge when you work in an organization, whether it's you know a academic organization or a development organization. It, it doesn't really matter. But you know, there's someone above you that wants specific outcomes, mm -hmm. and so it's sometimes hard to say, well, the outcomes are different person to person. But I think also yeah. that if they can see that different participants um, put other things into their new roadmap or their new project poster, the fact that they put something in that they received or worked with during the learning event shows that it already bore fruit. For example, the woman who did the next generation learning lab in in went back home, it means that she planted during the, the learning lab in Zanzibar, already budgeted for it, already had in mind who she would invite. And when she got home, it was how do you convince the people back home that these are the results of what she just learned. And then the trick is how do you convince the new followers to be the new change agents, like she was ours, like our child, and then she was doing the next generation, the grandchildren um, <laughs> of this learning event. So they are your great grandchildren, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I, I'm just uh, really amazed. Uh, when you described it in the beginning, you're talking about PowerPoints and worksheets, and now I see so much color and like multi dimension, and yeah. I'm like, I can't believe this happened in my <laughs> own decision. And they, I think you have our own classes. It's like evolved over a long period of time. And so when I when I see these photos, I'm like, wait, you were PowerPoints and worksheets before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's um, it it, it you know, it's um, I think the most the most gratifying thing about the way we've started working now for Cynthia and I, I'm gonna speak for Cynthia. No, um, <laughs> it is that it energizes us to see people become empowered. And mm -hmm. so seeing those like little light bulbs of transformation that kind of like it's like that that things is like firing off, you know, through the course of a week through through either just comments or or overhearing conversations or participation in in an activity or a video blog or a written blog as we start to sort of see and and experience other people's aha moments, you know, it's it's an amazing it's an energizing thing for me, and it, it 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 encourages me to move forward with this work and try to figure out how to bring this approach to more people. Because I think that what it does is, even for people that are not are not going to go on to be working in the technical area of like the topical area of a of a project, a lot of people will say in the evaluations afterwards, you know, I can use this in my personal life. Like this, mm -hmm. so enriches me on all levels, and so. I think that actually, um, whether you realize it or not, um, and I'm not sure that you do or did until I started talking to Natalie um, when we started talking to you this year, but um, what you, what I see you engaged in from LCL1 and LCL2 is you're engaged in creating open learning using rights-based approaches. Maybe mm -hmm. you don't use the same language we use, but you're trying to make available a class that is held you know, at an institution that's considered fairly elite, very expensive, only a limited number of people have access to like actually sit in a classroom classroom. And yet here you are, you know, opening the doors to having, you know, thousands of people participate in, and learn together for free. And that's a right space. I mean, you're 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 creating on there's a mode of participation and I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to look at the mode of participation <laughs> and decide where you are. <laughs> 
but you know you're 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 moving towards you know people learning you know doing by and for themselves and i think that that's just a really amazing thing and i and i didn't really realize that connection until Cynthia and I started talking, you know, with Natalie this year, but I think that maybe that's the unspoken kind of innate thing that really connected us to LCL1 was that somehow intuitively we we realized that you were trying to do the same things we do, except you weren't using the same language we, we do. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest empowering things that, that we see in our learning labs is when you give people the language to speak about something, particularly when they already knew some, some pieces of it, you know, they'll say, oh, I, I didn't know I was doing this thing that's an, considered an international standard or that's considered cutting edge or that's considered creative, but but I'm actually doing it, and that's the whole reason that in Nepal that they wanted to re reschedule day three was because they wanted to show us we're already doing some of what we think we're doing, what part of what you're, what you're talking about. Now we want to, like, compare and contrast where we're lagging because we wanted to like f figure out how to fill in those gaps and so that was a very exciting moment for them and so a lot of the feedback was just very like energized around you know the empowerment of having a language to talk about these things now yeah that's what's interesting that even though a lot of it is their work but you're still bringing in some kind of frameworks for talking about it or but but then again you're trying to make it as much as possible that like trusting that they're going to figure out what's the progression, right? If you give them the pieces, that they can probably figure out what's more empowered or less, right? Is that is that what they're doing in, in sorting out those parts? Yeah, yeah. And always we work from that experience to the you just, concepts. You just need to have uh, that person get it and then explain it to another person and so on. And then all of a sudden it's like wildfire. It goes around the room and people just, everyone gets it, whatever it is at the moment. Um, and I think that's the thing that I was always wondering in my work over the last 27 years in the field of international development is I would find these little gem projects that would be hidden like in some dusty village that was like, you know, very far from a capital. And I would see some amazing little project that was working beautifully. And I started to try to figure out what is the common denominator amongst all of these. Because when someone from an organization finds a little gem project, they immediately, their reaction is, we have to document and replicate and scale up nationwide. And yeah. it doesn't really work that way because you can't scale up something if if other people that you're scaling up in that area don't have that aha empowered moment. And so the work that we're doing is less about the topical issues now, I think. I mean, we're, we're brought in to work on a topical issue, but mm -hmm. our work is less in the learning lab environment about a topical issue and more about empowering people to explore and adapt and create and, and experiment and that if they look at everything through like a human rights based lens and they understand what rights based approaches are and they understand the basics of social change they can apply that to any topical area you know and again getting back to the LCL1 I mean I I see the conversations that have evolved over the last year and the way the class is you know evolving now and to me what you're working about is social change in the education sector mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you're doing mm -hmm. Rick Rose, was your, first, was your first question about LCL1 or LCL2? LCL1 um, just says when you were participants in LCL1 and you said that you were at having aha moments and you wanted to try it out, like how did, how did you take those initial steps um, for yourselves and for the for the setting that you wanted to work in? Well, I'll um, start. For, okay, sorry. Let me just tell a little bit about like how I like the the dynamic between Cynthia and I because a lot of a lot of what's happening, I don't think necessarily would have happened if we it was it's about serendipity you know there's a thread right now on the on hangout about mm -hmm. serendipity and and it really is true I mean we were both in the right place at the right time looking for something but we didn't know what um, you know we both are sort of artistic I have a more of a fine arts background to my work um, just you know educationally Cynthia has more of a formal um, you know education background in terms of schooling and um, so she has a lot of the theory about education and whatnot, and I have like sort of like the kind of hippy dippy creative like nothing's too weird to try once, you know, <laughs> like just <laughs> throw it against the wall. See, so like the spaghetti, my you know the spaghetti mar marshmallow thing to me is like, oh, of course, spaghetti and marshmallows. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, that makes perfect sense. So we just got to talking, and Cynthia was able to kind of um, you know bring in you know sort of I guess tackle the work of um, 
peppered and, and, and Piaget and people that were coming from her more formal educational background and explain that to me in a way that I could synthesize it. And then I would like be coming the internet simultaneously looking and I would find these like little gem videos and think, oh, this like illustrates that really complex, you know, concept. How can we work this into, you know, into a into a module session, you know, like where where can we fit this? And so we just started kind of riffing off of each other. Like literally it was a very kind of artistic creative process. And I was sort of like the video Pied Piper where I would just find things and like throw them out and say, what can we do with this? This is amazing, you know, and then we would we would figure out what what kind of aspect or concept that that illustrated. Um, Cynthia, I don't know if you want to add to that. It, to me, it, it was often when I got stuck with one of the things. For example, I wanted to do something with the makey makey. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't have enough background or computer skills or anything like that. But then the, just the fact that they could take a banana or Play-Doh to do something, that was an aha for me to use Alvin Ailey movie to show or ask questions about participatory or non-participatory communication. So it's more by analogy, and I think also it's, um, for example, the the um, the childhood um, items. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, oh, so anything can go. It's what what's important to the person learning. So asking the questions more about symbolic things, mm -hmm. and to me, working at the symbolic level allows you to go to the heart. So we were before working only head and hands, we were looking for ways to bring the heart in. And so we designed different sessions that we could say, okay, does this have hand? Does it have heart? Does it have head? Okay. So it, 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 it addresses the whole person. And I think all in all, we wanted the learning to be deeper and we wanted it to address the whole person. And going back to the fact that you're at MIT, this institution that has this whole lore around it and it's like okay if you can do it there why can't we do it wherever we are working <laughs> how do we break that quality to the whole person wherever we receive the be it in Zanzibar, be it Nepal or Bangladesh so it's to, to address the whole learner mm -hmm. and I think one of the <laughs> most important things that we're finding is that this approach transcends educational level, economic, you know, socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter whether you come from a small village in Nepal or a big city in urban West Africa, or you come from, you know, a remote province of South Africa, or, or you, you know, or you live in, you know, an urban area in Bangladesh. It doesn't matter who you are or what your social norms are. When you come to the table, it, it, there's something that equalizes about this whole thing, and I think that it's it's because of this sort of um, this equation that we have, which is you know the the h plus h equals h is head plus heart equals hands, which translates into um, you know knowledge is in your head, um, feeling is in your heart, and action is what comes out of you through your hands through whatever you do. And so when we make sure that we we complete the equation, so to speak, um, in each kind of like modular session that we're working on great things happen and, and you know I I was skeptical at first the first time I saw the Alvin Ailey stuff I said to Cynthia oh my god like really like <laughs> what, what's a room full of Bangladesh you know public health people gonna think about this like really like freaky you know modern mm -hmm. dance stuff it's like pretty esoteric mm -hmm. but they the discussion we didn't explain it we just at the end of that session we showed it and then we said okay discuss participatory or non participatory communication and then I went and like sort of just listened to the conversations and the conversations were deeper and more thoughtful than even I had myself thought about that and to me you know Alvin Ailey is not something that I think is strange to look at so it was interesting that people were able to look at something completely outside their normal daily comfort zone but they got it and they got it much more than even sometimes Cynthia and I got out of it so um, whatever we're doing the underlying sort of concept concept behind it is is allowing people from many different cultures and backgrounds to have similar transformational experiences, which is really the coolest thing about the whole thing, I think. And I think if I want to bring it back from leading from the LCL one to the LCL two, it's that I see um, 
what we try to do is to create a level playing field for everybody. And mm -hmm. I've seen it from session to session to session. And even now, how you have made, for example, the hangout, the breakout spaces, so much more that technology will not be in our way because every time you tinker and make it possible for us to participate, you're creating a level playing field for even a computer dumbo like me to participate, yeah? yeah. So the level cre uh, playing field, I think, is one of the biggest human rights principle that yeah. you can, that we have discerned in what you do, and that we try to put into the learning um, events that we create. And I, I guess I'm just curious, like where where you are now and what you're thinking about, um, you know, in the future with all the lessons that you've been learning and. Um, how you want to you know, continue working in, in this area with these approaches? I think we're to, at this point we're trying to figure out how to bring our approach to more people. Um, it's it's really an experiential ex learning experience. It's not it's something that you have to experience. Um, and so, you know, we we were I was talking to Natalie online about you know like is this something that could be translated, like could we take our course and translate it into an LCL model, you know, and, and I think to some extent we could, but there's always that experiential part that's going to be missing and, and it's it's so, so deep and, and transformational, so I think we're just, we're looking at different opportunities where we can work together, Cynthia and I, to, to continue furthering this learning lab approach and bring it to more people in many different, you know, avenues. I mean, we could do it through, not just through, um, you know, through the international development sector, but it's applicable to educational, you know, academic environments. It's applicable to private sector. You know, I mean, you could see corporations doing this for their employees and having it really change how their employees, like, you know, work more effectively and creatively. Um, so there's, I, I envision a lot of opportunities. It's just, you know, we're sort of like not sure how we get there, but we're looking, you know, that's the path we're kind of looking on, at, I think. Cynthia, do you want to add anything? Well, I, I can come up with an analogy. It's an accident looking for a place to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like Shari said, there, there are different settings in which we can um, uh, invite people into this kind of learning setting where they can explore and exchange their experience and come up with their own. I mean, I am so impressed with this woman who went home, had already budgeted for and looked for consultants to help her run her own learning lab. Yeah. yeah. And invited people from so many different settings, university, religious women organizations. So it, I think that because it's a, about the process of learning, it's about um, um, inviting people in to, to explore, to create their own culture of asking questions, to feel free to tinker with how they learn and how others could learn with them. So, yeah. yeah. I was wondering for you guys, for the LCL2 people, because going forward from this week, it's people thinking of, like, again, encouraging them to tinker and think about how might they want to apply. Like, what's the, just a next step, like you have at the end of yours? What's the next step? something you could try. Um, do you have thoughts for them about how to think about taking that first step maybe or next step of applying LCL? Where they need to start is what are the questions that they are most stuck on because that would be the place that they want to look for answers. So it's being aware of where, what is their biggest need in the area they want to learn. For example, when I couldn't do the makey makey, but I saw that I can do something with the elements that I'm faced with. Because I had pledged that I want to do my learning events in a different way. So that was one that motivated me. I think the other thing that they need to look at is what, what do they have now? Where is the system that they are um, working in currently? What are what Shari calls the low lying fruit? What would be the things that you could do, no cost, low cost, without having to ask permission? 
So those would be areas that you would have already uh, a possibility to start and then people get encouraged. It's like the lone man dancing on the hill. He had first only one follower to work with. So he took care of that first follower and then the next people would join that follower because they could see that following is not a dangerous thing. It's actually a fun thing. So where people are at now, wherever the system, like if someone is working in a classroom and wants to improve the classroom, within the classroom you don't have to get permission of the administrator. So work, work within that. If you're working with a computer clubhouse, what are the things you can bring with where you are at now that is no cost and low cost before you start um, the big things? I don't know, Shari, what you want to add to that? Um, I would say, like, just uh, you know, building on what Cynthia said, in, um, elaborating on something simple. If you're if you're a teacher and you're working in the classroom, you probably can't change the curriculum or the national requirements. That's like something that's so far down the road for you that it seems impossible. But surely you can change the structure of your phys the physicality of your classroom. So ask your students. Hey guys, instead of having desks in row, how do you want to learn? If you can, if you could reconstruct the, the room in any way you want to, what would you do? And I would literally, as a teacher, say you have like 20 minutes. I'm going to stand outside in the hallway. You guys figure it out, and I'll come back in. And I would let them hash out like, what do they want their learning room to look like? You know, is it in little pods and little groups and in work tables? Is it in like a big circle? How do they want their room to look? Because you don't need Board of Education, at least I don't think, you need Board of Education approval <laughs> to change the structure of like how your desks are set up or how your room is set up. And those are the kind of things that, you know, that's just something simple that you can do just to start A, shifting, shifting power to the learners, asking learners what's the physical environment that you're comfortable learning in and trying to meet that need as a first step because that's an easy thing to do. Um, you know, and then as you progress, I mean, if you have something that's really some exciting stuff that you're doing, um, you know, whether it's artistic, whether it's making makey stuff, I mean, if you do like a whole orchestra out of, you know, fruit and bananas with makey makey, invite parents. Yes. Because parents go to the PTA and they start talking and then parents can be your first, your second followers, they're following their kids, their mm -hmm. kids come home energized about something and they want more of it and then the parents go to the PTA and say, our kids love this, we want more of this for your, our kids and they start to become the advocates and the evangelizers for you. So it's about trying to figure out strategically what's the low-hanging fruit that you can start with and achieve success and then how can you build those, you know, that movement of followers, of first mm -hmm. followers, of, of second followers and, and who's going to help support and advocate for, for that change, whatever the change looks like that you're, that you're you know, pushing for. And I think in addition to that, um, the person starting it also needs to look after themselves. So you're not doing it alone. Shari and I did it together. So anybody that's going to try a new project or work in another environment, they need to find another person that can be their buddy. Like Shari is my lady buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that we can, you're never alone out on a limb. At least you're out there with another person and you can have fun together. And you can talk and you can explore so that you can... It's in your spiral, it's the sharing before you reiterate. Yeah. We didn't ask you, can you just say a little bit about the, the name Learning Labs? I remember that was another thing that you had been debating and, and how that came about. Oh, yeah. I asked last year. See, this is just, this kid, this is a lesson that everything you type on the internet stays there forever and <laughs> ever. Natalie <laughs> <laughs> will find it. <laughs> Yeah, no, last year, um, at, towards the end of the class, I had already, you know, Cynthia and I had been brainstorming about this, and I said, okay, I need to call this something, but I don't want to call it a, a, you know, SBCC is Social and Behavior Change Communications. I didn't want to call it an SBCC workshop, because that's typically what we call it. I didn't want to call it a training, because both training and workshop, at least in the international development sector, has a, a very strong connotation um, of I'm going to go to this event, I'm going to collect my per diem money, I'm going to sit there and pretend I'm interested, I'm going to get barrage with PowerPoints and people talking and it's going to be like the Charlie Brown thing with the like wah 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 <laughs> and then at the end I'll get my transport money and I'll go back home and business as usual. 
And so we didn't want to use the words training or the words workshop at all. And all I could think of was learning lab. And I mean, I was thinking, I think the lab part came from, you know, part of it was like media lab, you know, it's sort of like coming out of like the LCL was under the umbrella of the media lab. But then mm -hmm. I thought lab, a lab like lab laboratory is where you do experiments and, you know, you do a lot of trial and error. And sort of that sort of felt like that's what we were doing anyway. So it just instinctively felt like, you know, this is a learning lab. Um, and it's actually quite, quite, it's cute and funny that a lot of countries that we go to, the norm is to have a big banner that is produced. Like, whether you like it or not, it's like de rigueur. You have to have this giant banner with everybody's, like, logos on it. And it goes at the front of the room somewhere. And the first time we saw it, it said SBCC, or Social and Behavior Change Communication Learning Laboratory. <laughs> Everyone talked about Learning Laboratory. And it was just so funny to me. I'm like, laboratory. No, it's just lab. It's a, and it, it, it couldn't like, you know, sh cut the word short. It had to be the full word. And I remember looking at the sign and it was in the head of the room and I said, could you just put it over to the side somewhere because I don't want this like banner to be like the focus of the entire, you know, um, event. So we stuck it on the sidewall somewhere. But it was just it's just a funny like side note of people's <laughs> reaction to it. I mean, somebody reacted very strongly to it. Um, saying, you know, I really, I don't like that, I don't like that, you know, why can't you just call it a workshop, you know, and I mm -hmm. tried to explain why I didn't want to call it a workshop, because everyone has workshops, and it's always like same, 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 and there's just this mind-numbing kind of like effect from most workshops, um, and I think that a lot of the, a lot of the specific feedback in the evaluations, which are anonymous, has specifically said the Learning Lab lived up to its name. Mm -hmm. uh, wonder when they come in, like I'll ask people, Cynthia will ask people on the side, like did you wonder about the name of this when you were coming here? Yes, we don't know what is it we are coming to, it's like, you know, what does it mean learning lab, you know? And then at the end they're like, no, we get it now. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and like you said, so at least people are curious, like, okay, I haven't been to one of these before, so that cues them in, this is going to be something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well the other thing that makes it, it different is, you know, we have a, a, a reflective meditation exercise and we ask them to bring an object from home, and I won't say what, because hopefully you'll go through this experience at some point, so I don't want to ruin it for you. But <laughs> everyone always wants to know, why do you want us to bring that thing from home? But And, and I thought the first time when Cynthia, it was Cynthia's idea, I said, no one's going to bring that thing from home. She said, Sherry, they will, they will. When we got to the venue, I said, did everyone bring their thing from home? <laughs> yes, we have it. I was the only one who didn't bring it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't find one at the location we were at, but it was just funny because everyone was wondering why is it called the learning lab and why do you ask us to bring this thing from home? We ask people to also bring like at least one quote that's inspirational to them for an inspiration wall where we have them put quotes up and mm. you know they, they're just things that they've never been asked to do before, but they've got all this stuff. It's all inside them. It just no one's ever asked them to like let it out and share it with 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 other people and when they do, you know, that's sort of when that multicultural, multi, you know, cutting across all sectors, you know, thing happens where it doesn't matter who you are, you've got something that gives you inspiration, you know, you've got some, you know, interesting thing to say and all of a sudden, you know, you're in an environment where people are saying, what do you think? It's like, you want to know what I think? You know, but you're supposed to tell me what I think. No, <laughs> tell me what you think. So, you know, it's sort of that whole culture of asking questions and just creating, you know, that safety to explore and, and tinker is, um, I think, at the heart of it all.